Alan, you oversee a few firms at Arcadis. Uh, you oversee the BIM implementation. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And um, well, I see that we will. It, I don't think it's about trusting the data uh, as much about trusting each other. It's about BIM to us is about collaboration, openness. Um, Richard touched on the point this morning that um, you know we use BIM to define where we are now, but we'll have different concepts in five years, ten years, something like that. The construction industry, construction engineering industry, the, you know, and the consultancies that we're in, we're very adversarial and contractual. Um, you know, it's been recognised for the last 25, 30 years that I know of, and we don't seem to be able to change that. Um, but I think in the UAE in particular, we, we have um, a slightly different scenario. We've got very, very strong clients, and those clients have, all, uh, through the sponsorship arrangements and you know the natural arrangements that we have over here actually um, have lots of say with the contracting companies as well. So I see that things will change. We were talking about, um, you know, some people aren't going to do BIM until the government mandates it, and then some people can't do BIM un unless we've got the client's BIM information requirements. And the other refreshing thing, you know, we had Ben Corrigan saying that sort of back in 2012, they embraced BIM. Um, and they're leading as a you know a smaller company, not one of the you know behemoths that we're looking at here. So I actually think that we'll reach a critical mass, and that uh, rosy tinted spectacles. But I think that we will all start speaking to each other, and we will all start to collaborate. And we're going to laugh. We'll be moving on to different challenges in five and ten years. We'll we'll look back at this stage and think, you know, why did we struggle with it? Okay. So a few th points that were touched upon here. You said common language, so uh, we will understand each other, speak the same language, that back to taxonomy and certain standards, so that an interoperability. Um, information requirements from clients, are, let's, if they're not a client, let's in look at internal stakeholders. Information requirements from the next party that you'll pass your design to, your model to. That's important. Um, what contract obligations and how contracts are drafted here? Um, if, if your payment is a drawing, then it depends on a drawing submission, then why is the model the basis of design? Uh, Scott, you... Yeah, well, I, I was just thinking, I mean, on that original question, you know, will we go to, you know, contract documents you know, or, or the, the, the kind of conversion to a BIM model forming the contract documents? I mean, I still think there is a, a strong element here with design teams that they like to caveat their liability in all honesty. And, you know, no designer is going to want to say base everything completely on my design. Um, you know, I'm going to let the contractor just go away and build that. Um, you know, you'll always get the one-liner in there that the contractor is responsible for developing this or designing this or X, Y, and Z. And I think it's a, it would be a brave step for designers to say, yep, I'm going to you know, make the BIM model my, my complete liability um, for the contractor to build. But at the same time, maybe that's a great step forward as well for driving the industry forward with that as well. So if the BIM model is in the base of the design, Sean, as a contractor, would you see a day when you don't need to produce drawings. It'll be the basis of your construction as well. Um, I, I personally think that we're uh, a long way uh, Sean. from that. Sorry. Can you hear me? Just press the button, hold it down it's for on. a second. Is it's it? on. Okay, I, I personally think that we're quite a long way um, from that uh, on, on, a, on a personal level and, and the BIM team at uh, Aounda Buda. We wouldn't have a problem with receiving um, a BIM model which we had to work off of, provided that we could sit down with the, the client and the design team at the beginning and actually define what it is that we need as a contractor from the design team. So we don't need everything, but we'd have to define the data that needed to be contained within that model to the level of detail that we needed um, so they produce the model with the end in mind. We would then sit down and then look at linking that to um, our bills of quantities um, and taking that off. In terms of on-site, um, again, you know, receiving a BIM model, we would still probably work in, in 2D. I don't think uh, we're in a situation now where we can all work in 3D. You've got to remember that we've got people within our construction team that are not um, BIM familiar. So, for instance, commercial managers, quantity surveyors, health and safety guys, everyone within that team need to, need to be trained up. And these guys are at different um, ages and different levels of experience. So you've got to go through a whole um, change process within your organization and bring these guys on board. And that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. Um, I would personally like to see this as something that was put in place by a, 
uh, very BIM savvy clients that was working with the design team collaboratively with the contractor and putting this forward as something that we could all learn from almost as a pilot project and run through from beginning to end and then and then go through that process um, again so that's uh, yeah. um, so you mentioned the need for more information and uh, clients input as well as the ability to visualize and actually understand exactly what this model intends or the design intent of this model is Charles do you see virtual reality helping in that respect and what about augmented reality where you're actually capturing uh, c actual conditions and then augmenting the BIM model to understand how to erect or how to design uh, something uh, virtual reality lets virtual reality lets people uh, explore BIM models who are not perhaps used to or, or, or comfortable reading drawings and you can hide a lot of information in drawings um, missing levels missing data when you put it into virtual reality, then you're exploring it at the human scale. So this allows all collaborators to explore the model and understand. Just to elaborate on virtual reality, are you referring to model walkthroughs or using a VR headset or a, a cave? Um, well, virtual reality, and I've got a presentation after lunch, is uh, you've got virtualization, which is taking 3D content and making it interactive. So if you want to define virtual, Virtual is the taking something that's not interactive and if you virtually press a light switch, the light comes on in the digital model. The reality part is how you uh, present that to the, to the visitor, to the user, and that can sometimes be a, a headset that we've seen. But it could also be the content is very similar, but the, the type of projection could be a, an igloo or a cave that you've talked about, because no, headsets are not for everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, the data comes from the BIM side. Um, yeah, so the, the information comes from the BIM, and that allows us to more easily create a virtual reality environment that's interactive. So uh, basically, you mentioned something that uh, I've been heard many people in the BIM in or industry talk about is AI, artificial intelligence. And that comes from understanding building systems, understanding also the information in the, in the elements that someone were virtually. Can you elaborate a bit on how that's done, or will you cover that in the presentation? <laughs> yeah, I'll go pitching my uh, presentation. Presentation, later. all right. We <laughs> <laughs> and Christoph, um, wanted to ask you now, with model-based decision-making or using a model to uh, help clients understand what they're getting, help contractors understand what they need to build, uh, have you seen an increase in automation in terms of production of information that you need as a contractor to, uh, uh, from, from a BIM model? Production of 2D information, maybe extracting digital information, like uh, your BOQ? Um, <coughs> Am I on? Test. Yeah, no. Um, are you referring to the construction phase? Yes. So, yeah. Um, and design phase as well. Yeah. I think in the design phase, what we see right now is that we, we see an expansion of the type of automation that we saw in the classic use case in, in design coordination. So before you do, did visual inspections, often of 2D, and then you found geometric clashes. And now you press a button, you define rules, and you press a button, and you get a markup, and then you use a brain, a human brain, to decide whether that is an actual problem or not and you saw through it. So you have an automated algorithm that helps you. And I think we will see that in more applications throughout the de design and then later construction as well. So in the, design, in the design phase, in planning and scheduling, it might be that now you define, you ha define certain rules and then the computer will give you um, five schedules that are just done by an algorithm and you, as the human planner, have to select, okay, we take this one and this component from the uh, fourth schedule, and then you assemble it. So it's, m I think the next steps will be assistance systems like that, just like the design coordination algorithm is helping you sort through the clashes. This will help sort you through planning, and you will see more and more processes where you have these kinds of assistance systems. I mean, model production is, uh, is, is, uh, is one where I think everybody can think of a Revit macro that helps you uh, um, put hangers into the model. <coughs> so that would involve but somebody um, do programming some sort of API in, in, in uh, your, your authoring tool. Um, and we, we talked about uh, con construction without a drawing, we talked about having a model as your contract deliverable, 
Um, so this would mean maybe no draftsman, no, well, not other, no, no need for draftsman, maybe no need for quantity surveyor. Are we seeing a change in the roles and responsibilities and job titles in BIM? Is this something that in the future you think that there won't be some um, draftsman, there'll be a BIM engineer, um, there won't be a need for, or architects will need to have uh, some sort of basic training in programming, which some, of sco some schools are purely art-based. Alan? Yeah, we're moving into systems engineering. It sounds like some other people are in the same space that we are. So once you get the, the processes aligned and the rules-based systems, so you have the artificial in intelligence. So that, that works that section through. Um, everyone seems to be scared that they, you know, they're going to be replaced and you don't need a draftsman. You, you won't need specific types of people, but you'll need different types of people. So I don't think it's something that everybody should be worried about. The other thing is that and you, you actually need this education. Everybody needs to develop themselves to be part of their natural DNA. We're still based on these old... Uh, um, Richard, again, this morning, we, you know, we looked at the data dumps and the traditional recycles and things, and we'll move into this space where we'll look... We're already finding this, where you think, well, we don't need to do that. We can streamline this bit, and uh, it, it makes it a whole lot easier. But the other thing is that we're sort of talking about design and we're looking at the whole life cycle of, of any, any buildings and any assets. And we're thinking that the BIM is owned by the designers at the start and then the contractors come in and do a little bit and the cost consultants, again, all very fragmented. But we're looking at different people with different skill sets. My kids aren't going to use computers the way that we use computers. You know, they won't use a keyboard, they're all on iPads and things. And that's going to, you know, we've got the virtual reality coming in as well. So we talk about it being disruptive, and we're still trying to control it in terms of our traditional construction processes. And in five years, ten years' time, it's just people are going to come in with a diff different concepts and look at it completely different. So again, Richard's viewpoint this morning about BIM being this marketing concept, we'll call it something differently in a few years. So uh, if we you know, borrow from American term, it will be the standard of care that clients expect the industry to provide. Um, it's not something that should be thought of as a unique way of working or a value-added way of working. It should be the standard of care. Nobody will be using the term BIM anymore. I'm, a, I'm an architect. Well, I know how to program, come up with iterations, design options, give you a model that then you can use to construct from. Um, on the subject, I wanted to ask about the f facility management. Now, architects do designs but these buildings need to be managed. Um, contractors build these designs, and this building still need to be managed. Um, how does BIM play into design? Um, how can we use BIM to uh, assess the human factor in design, uh, or environmental psychology, if you will? Um, and how can we use BIM to help assist the contract or the, the operator of the asset in terms of proper handover and then operation of that asset? Scott, would you like to discuss about? Um, yeah, okay. Well, I think we had a great quote um, this morning, which was, which was using technology as an enabler. And I think there's, there's some elements here that you know, are very easy to predict where we're going to go, and there's some elements that are very difficult to see. Um, but I think you know, the, the, the truth is, at the moment, um, you know, BIM really is, is you know, still in, in its infancy. It's quite, it's quite sort of early on. Um, you know, I think there was a slide earlier from the RTA that showed it sort of really coming into effect in the UK and in the US around about 2000, uh, you know, between sort of 2000, 2005, and starting to gain some traction. So how is this going to start to implement designers a bit more? How is this going to start to influence contractors? How is this going to start to infl in, well, influence the operation teams of buildings is, is a good question. I think I thought of an analogy earlier that, that was similar this morning when I got in my car to drive down here. I opened up Google Maps and I looked at it and it shows you the traffic, it shows you where the roads are, shows you where's busy, what, where's blocked, you know, where, which is the fastest route to get from A to B. And if you look at that from a technological point of view, if you'd said to the Road and Transport Authority, you know, 10 years ago, why don't you develop Google Maps and you'll save yourself 20 billion on, on infrastructure, you know, of, of congested flyovers, they probably would have said, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do it. But to foresee that, that change or, or that, that sort of, foresee that, that, that sort of um, opportunity, is, is quite difficult to do. But I think there's great opportunities there in sort of in, in the facility management or, or component or looking at sort of building operation. 
um, you know, particularly in terms of the augmented reality, and I mean that differently from sort of uh, virtual reality, but being able to, you know, have your BIM model there for a facility management team, when something breaks, let's say, you know, fan coil 65 on level B12 has, you know, had a, had a, uh, a belt break, um, and you're able to immediately flag that up on the BMS, it gets pre-ordered, somebody can go down there, check with the roof on an iPad, yep, that belt's broken, open it up, there's a RFID tag on the fan coil unit, yep, okay, that's the one that's broken, open it up, change the belt, done, record the date, warranty date, everything like that. That's a huge, huge benefit to BIM. And I think, you know, we're talking a lot about design and construction, but there's also the huge benefits that will be seen in operation uh, with something like BIM. You mentioned Google Maps, and I think the interesting thing, if you do have a properly done BIM model, you can hook it up to your BAS, and then and if you set some color codes for your equipment, you can see which are overheating, the flow of certain uh, in certain pipes, maybe the flow rates and temperatures of others as well. So it'd be, we can have, we're almost there, uh, having a Google Maps of your building where you can see how it's just visually, I'm um, not sure how useful that would be without looking actually at hard numbers, but you can see how your building's operating. Um, what about the handover process? Alan, uh, uh, Arcadis works a lot with clients as well, as, and they've got design teams. Have any of your clients been very particularly interested on the handover process and wanting data and a, a model that's handed over to help them with op operating their building. We're combining quite a lot of the disciplines. Um, so as well as the, you know, the front end design, we have construction management, construction supervision, and we are actually handing over um, some projects. It, it's not full BIM, it's what I call, you know, we're, we're sort of a bit of a mental construct. It's, we're best of a bad world at the moment, but this is the next step to somewhere else. So we're actually um, developing the O&M manuals on getting contractors and suppliers and so on to develop those in the BIM model. You know, the software's there at the moment. Um, Aconex do something. Um, it's not, you know, full BIM as such. Um, but it allows people, lots of disciplines, they don't actually use Revit. You know, I can't tell some of my cost guys to go and use Revit, and we can't tell some of our construction managers. So they have a, you know, a visualization, and they can access it, and then they can get the O&M information. Um, so yeah, we are implementing that at the moment. And just, so just one other point as well. We sort of rely at the moment on designers or teams um, preparing a BIM model and passing that through to somebody else. But we're moving into this sphere now where um, you know, microchips are going to be so cheap. We talk about the Internet of Things and so on. Everything's going to have a microchip in it. It's going to tell you where it is. You know, the light will be able to tell you. That one of those lights will tell you where it's located in the building. Radio frequency identification tags, you know, if that table moves. So all this is really beneficial to operations, facilities management, and we'll look at that in different ways too. Sean, do you want to add on that? And yeah, it's a uh, contractor, and it, what are your handover procedures at the moment, and where do you think they'll be in, in a few okay. years' time? The, you know, we, we, we start at the traditional you know, 1,000 hard copy files to be handed over as part of the O&M manuals, which, as a contractor, is very, very difficult to, to manage. Um, moving forward from that, if you've got a very um, BIM-savvy client that started with the end in mind, and we've developed the model to create um, it, it to the right level of delivery, um, then we can hand over a model in the format that they want, but more importantly, we then they don't really get much benefit from that other than the fact that it's a, a 3D model that's got a couple of um, as-built drawings associated with it. It doesn't really provide them with much value. And if you go back to PASS 1192, until we start to go through the client-driven whole process um, from beginning right through to end with the, with the BIM model and the whole, and the whole process, we're not going to get the true value of BIM. Mo moving forward, we, we've started to pair up with a company in the UK called eDocuments, and they started off by specialising in producing electronic O&M manuals, okay? And they've moved on from there, where we now can produce a 3D model at the end of the process, and we can start to link the data between the electronic O&Ms and elements of the, um, of the uh, BIM model, which could be uh, Revit, or in more, more importantly, it's um, usually Navisworks. So that then takes us through to uh, you know, the next step where the BIM model becomes beneficial to the client in the terms that they can quite easily, once they learn to navigate through the model, turn layers on and off, select a light, they can then immediately be taken through to that um, data sheet associated with that. Moving from there um, is, is the next step in terms of a true FM tool in terms of using the BIM model to actually run and understand um, the, um, the, the building as it operates. And I think we're a very long way 
uh, from that. So we're, we're trying with our clients to um, push forward the, um, the, the digital model linked with the digital O&Ms and then take it a step later um, after that. So I've heard the words digital, electronic, data. Um, Alan, you mentioned, um, what was it Yeah, you mentioned? I forgot what term you mentioned. IoT, Internet of Things. Um, this all means information overload, data overload, big data. It could be useful, it could be useless. Um, Chris, Christoph, how do you manage data in a BIM process? How do I manage data? What? Data in a BIM process. The future of that, that, that's a, question. a very very general mm -hmm. question. Can you can you All right. specify that a little bit? So we've got um, data that can be attributed to elements in a BIM model, mm -hmm. right? Some of this data is important to know at certain times. Some some of it would only come on board in the construction process once an element has been procured in reality or approved by a consultant, etc. Um, what is your take on managing data in BIM for the benefit of the stakeholders next in line, whether they're a different or the contractor or another design consultant or at handover? Do you manage it in the model? Do you create separate yeah. databases yeah. that you manage it through that? Um, yeah. You put that data in the cloud. What are the challenges with uh, interoperability or standardizing that data? I think with the, um, the one thing that's been said repeatedly before is you start from the end. And this is very important here as well. I mean, you have to find out where does this data, is it going to get used, in what system, and who's going to use it and for what. And that can help you determine um, where to put it. And I can give you a general answer. As a general answer, we usually prefer um, and recommend clients to use separate databases and just link it to the model. Just because with an open format database, we are more flexible of importing into systems later just if we're talking about the technology now. Um, but there are special cases if you have, if you are a client down the line, for example, if we're talking about Asbuild, for example, if the, uh, the operator uses Archibus and has a version in operation that can import directly from Revit, it might just make sense to put the data into, into the Revit model. Um, so we would probably, in, on a given project, look definitely on who is the entity that most sensibly can put the data in and where do we want the data at the end and then um, look at that on an individual basis so this guy who puts the data in will be used to working in a certain system maybe that makes sense to use that for input and then we have to get it somewhere to the output if you want a general answer i would say we recommend not overloading the model um, and just putting a, an a linking an extra database that we can flexibly uh, import in several other. So that would allow the an, an owner or anyone next in line to receive that model, to query that data, get the relevant information that they need. It's all centralized over there, exactly. and not in certain and documents. And, that and usually you have add-ins. Haven't been managed. Uh, add-ins to import from a, from an open database format into several author uh, authoring okay. systems. So n no matter what you're using, you're going to get it uh, linked somehow. So we've touched on a few interesting topics about the future in, of BIM be as we conclude this session, because we are out of time. I have one question to each panelist. I want you all to name one roadblock to implementing the future that we just talked about. I'll start with Laura. It could be contracts, information requirements. I want more skilled people, uh, better computers. You know, 4.4 <laughs> gigahertz isn't enough if, if you buy an overclocked machine. I ha if I had to mention one, could it be all of the above? All right. I think, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, not just one thing. I think there's it's many facets. I mean, BIM is such a misunderstood uh, topic, such a misunderstood acronym. I think you know, th it's just yeah, there's it's, it's big, big data, and it's 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 a big conversation. Uh, I think incentives are important. I actually have heard about a, a, a bag of bag of money, a, a bonus being there for people to, you tell people to work together, but until you give them a big bag of money that says, please work together, they won't actually do it. I want so a I big think stick. Well, I'm more of a carrot than a stick okay. kind of guy, but <laughs> yeah. Um, Scott, yeah, I was, I was thinking incentives initially as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, note uh, from another point of view as well, um, you know, not just, not just the education and the knowledge base for, for resources, which you touched on, but I think also um, perhaps the element that no design is perfect and when you're designing something things need to change you know this is the whole issue with with using one of the so understanding better understanding so yeah 
Um, I, I would say a key barrier to success is um, lack of awareness. Um, don't underestimate, um, y you know, how much these, you know, the guys that work have worked in the construction industry for 20, 30 years, don't know about BIM, and how much value they would get out of a very simple uh, lunchtime session where you actually talk to them about BIM, the very, very simple terms. You know, you, uh, you know, I often visit sites, um, arrange for some sandwiches to come in, talk to them about PASS 1192, BIM level two, and and they come up to you afterwards and say, "Wow, I didn't know that," and it's, it's very, very simple. So I would say lack of awareness. Um, that they don't, people don't know what they don't know. Alan, um, for me, the big bag of money is already there. Um, the incentives already there. It's for people to adapt, change, innovate, or they're going to be swept so aside. So proper basically. change management then. Yeah. And Christoph. I don't have a catchy uh, name for it, but I would describe it as uh, a general fear in several areas of our industry of front-loading a schedule or a project. So everybody is afraid of making that step of investing now to get the return later. Everybody can relate to, ah, oh, it makes sense to do clash detection uh, and, and 3D coordination, uh, but in this project my budget is tight and I have to finish quickly, so I'm not going to invest in training people. And then three months down the line, ah, oh, now we have this total chaos and it's so uncoordinated. How did that happen? So upskilling and, and training up I front. I can give you like 10 examples like that. So right. it's, it's the fear of, of investing that money now for an insecure, supposedly insecure return later. That is, is Some interesting thoughts. I'm surprised thought. nobody's mentioned time. We want more time because some of these future uses are new to us and we do need to test that process out a little bit. And we won't test that process until that project starts, until we get that contract signed. And if you look at the BS1192 process or the past process, or there's this mobilization period that you need to, to, to take advantage of, to test the processes, some of the interoperability, some of the challenges that you'll be facing down the road in the project before it's too late, before you've signed up on, signed that subcontractor on a contract that says he needs to do something in a certain way that doesn't work. And you're now in a contract dispute when you need to actually be authoring models and drawings. Um, so uh, folks, I'd like you to show your appreciation for our panelists today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did.